G'day, it's Prezo here, back in the shop, and thanks for dropping by. This is uh, another video, and I say another one because I'm not quite sure what uh, version I'm up to or what episode I'm up to, so I'm just going to put a number here. Episode 6! So that's right, it's episode number whatever that was. In this uh, episode, we're going to look at uh, the finishing for this. This is an Art Deco inspired Lixie digital clock, and uh, I've done previous videos on this there's a playlist uh, if you want to go back and look at those but in this one we're going to look specifically at getting a finish on this wood and by that I mean we're going to coat this to make it resistant to moisture and oil and damage and abrasion and I'm going to use what I call a hybrid French polishing process and by that I mean I begin with a traditional shellac and I'm going to build that up using a, a semi traditional method and when I get to the point where it's got the color and the, the sort of texture that I'm looking for I'm going to finish off with a nitrocellulose lacquer coating sprayed on. Now I find that this gives you the best of both worlds. You get the color and the, the depth of finish that you would associate with French polishing but you also get a much more durable top coat. This is not a tutorial in traditional French polishing. If you uh, look at what I do and compare that to the old school method, you'll see a lot of shortcuts that I take. But I find that I get a good finish that most people would look at it and say, yes, that's French polish. So the materials that I'm using are linen cloth. Now you, you don't have to use linen. It's a bit hard to get, but in the early stages, there's reasons why that works better. I'm also using cotton waste and uh, this acts like a reservoir for the shellac. It'll suck up the liquid shellac and keep it in the rubber while you apply it to the wood. So the process for making the rubber is basically just take your linen cloth, put a handful of cotton waste in that, wrap it up to make a ball and then soak it in shellac and then that gets applied to the wood. Now having said that, I have had success just using a piece of cotton t-shirt material and you can just sort of wad that up into that sort of shape, dip it in liquid shellac and rub it on the wood. But the other thing that I'm going to use in this case is pumice powder. Now this is triple F grade pumice powder and I only just started using this recently and I, I realize now that it's a, it's a really good way of filling open grain timbers. What the pumice powder does is it abrades the wood surface as you start to put the first coats on. That slurry of shellac and abraded wood fiber gets uh, ground into the pores and it very quickly fills that grain and leaves you with a, a much more even coating. So this clock here is completely unfinished, just bare wood. On the, the other clock that I'm making, I am doing two of these, I've already started with that process of building up the shellac finish and this one, as you can see, is starting to get a gloss, it's got the colour that I'm looking for, so I'm going to leave this now and this is going to be sprayed later, but that'll just give you an idea of where we're headed with this. So the uh, linen cloth uh, is cut to a you know, rectangular shape, rough rectangular shape. I'm going to double this over. And what you do then is you take some of this cotton waste, uh, just sort of a rough wad like that. Uh, depending on the size of the project you're doing, you can make do with more or less. Um, it sort of needs to fit comfortably in your hand and it does compress a bit as you work with it. So this wadding or this um, cotton waste is going to act like a sponge and it's going to suck up the excess shellac and hold it there while you apply it to the job. Okay, then all you do is you start pulling the corners of that linen in. And then twist that up until you get a shape a bit like that. Okay, and that twisted section just fits back into the palm of your hand there. And that's basically it. And you dip that into a bowl of shellac if you want to do it that way. Pick it up and then you start applying that to your wood. The method I use though is I just sort of pour it on the outside of the rubber and then work from there. So there's our rubber. Now like I said, you can just use a bit of cotton t-shirt material. You, once again, you can put um, the wadding inside that and ball it up in the same way. You can just leave it like that and use it and it works. 
One thing you don't want to do though is uh, don't use cotton wool as the, the wadding inside your rubber. It just compresses down very quickly and ends up being like a, a lump of felt and it doesn't give you that soft spongy surface on the rubber that you need. And what we do now is we just take our shellac and I just put that over the neck of the bottle and tip that and you can see there that's now got enough shellac on it to start the process. Now the other thing that you should have is like a container and this is one of the rubbers that I was working with on the other part of the clock and that's still wet and soft and I'll leave that in there and then I'll put this one away when I'm finished and when I come back in like an hour or something it's still going to be ready to use. If you just leave it out in the bench it's going to go hard and brittle and it'll be unusable. Alright, I've got this piece here which is the back of the clock and yes I'm starting with something really simple and easy to do. The three dimensional form like this body of the clock is going to be a, a bit more of a challenge but this will give you an overview of the process and then you can deal with more difficult things later. So the important thing here is that you have your wood really well prepared. If there's any blemishes or pencil marks or glue marks there now they're going to get trapped under your layers of finish and they'll be there forever. They'll just look glossy, that's all. And the other thing you need to do is just make sure you work fairly clean. I'm just using a tack cloth there to pick up any stray dust before I start the process. Okay, first step, get your pumice powder. And I've I actually put quite a lot of this. I'll never, ever, ever use all of it. But what I've done is I've made up a little muslin bag so I can just sprinkle that on the wood. You don't need a lot. Okay, now get your previously prepared rubber that you made. And I'm just going to dose that up with some more shellac. So when you've made this rubber for the first time, it um, takes a while for it to soak up enough shellac to do the job. But just be patient. Okay, then just start rubbing that in with a sort of a circular motion or figure eights. Now the pumice will get picked up in the, the end of the rubber or the face of the rubber and that is now acting like an abrasive. And you can see how quickly that's starting to dry. So the uh, alcohol evaporates off very quickly, leaves behind that coating of wood dust and pumice and a, a very, very tiny thin layer of shellac, which sort of sets and seals the grain. You'll feel it just feels a little bit rough and bristly after you've done that. And you just repeat that process. Now I'm going to put a glove on because um, if you've been doing this for a while, after um, a couple of hours you start to look like you've been smoking for all your life. You just get this sort of yellow uh, coating on your skin. It doesn't look terribly attractive. It's hard to get off. Okay, so a little bit more shellac. Now, what you'll notice is after a while you start to get a sort of a smeary coating on the wood and it sort of wrinkles up and balls up and looks really untidy, looks like you've ruined it but don't worry it'll come off now I'm applying you know, fairly moderate pressure here because the idea is we want to cut this back and make that surface fill with uh, wood powder and pumice and, and shellac. So it does require a little bit of pressure. And I'll do a little bit more and I'll show you what I mean. The other thing you'll notice is that the face of the rubber gets worn out very quickly. I've already gone through one layer of that linen there. 
uh, and that's because of the abrasive um, pumice that's doing that. But what you do is you just simply open up the, the pad and rearrange it and you'll get a, a clean face to work with. And that was sort of why I got two layers of linen. So you can either turn it inside out or just rotate it, find a fresh part to work with and reform the rubber. But in the early stage you'll find that you wear out the face set rubber very quickly. And then as you squeeze, you see, or you should see, the shellac starting to come through onto that surface. Now already I can feel that that's smoothing out. Now, I think you can just start to see, or you should just start seeing a sort of a shine in the middle of that, which is what we're looking for. So in that area there, at least, the wood grain is now starting to fill up, and he's starting to get that gloss. So I'll do a little bit more, and we'll check it out again. Now, after a while, you can switch to a, a long figure eight or just long strokes with the rubber working off either end. So if you're going to do figure eights, it's just like that in a continuous motion. The most important thing is you don't stop. If you pause just for a second, the liquid shellac will damage the coating that you've already put on it. So try and keep it moving the whole time. All right, now, can you see, there you go, can you see the gloss starting to come up on that? So I'm going to keep going with this, I won't show you everything, but that's essentially the process that you use. The uh, coating that we're putting on now is called bodying up, so we're building up the layers of shellac. In the early stages you can just keep working on this continuously, uh, then as it uh, gets thicker and thicker you've got to leave it aside maybe for 10, 15, 20 minutes depending on how long you've been working on it. Give it a very, very light sand back and keep going. Okay, but that's essentially the process we're going to use. Now, I just thought I'd show you this. Um, you can, or you may be able to see little sort of wrinkly bits on the surface of the shellac there. And that is the uh, cellulose fibre. It's been ground up by the pumice and it's now being sort of squashed into the open pores of the, the wood grain. And that's what does the filling. And because you're abrading that surface, the colour match is going to be accurate. So whatever you're putting into those open pores is the same colour as the surrounding wood. The pumice itself sort of goes translucent or transparent so you don't see that. But you've got to work through that stage. Keep going. It looks like you've ruined it but you haven't. You just keep going. Keep grinding that stuff in there until it sort of wipes off the surface completely and then you'll find that you've got completely filled grain. You can see it fairly clearly there. Now you can just let that dry and then sand that off lightly and then start again. But I usually just keep going. It'll eventually just sort of get absorbed by the linen cloth or wiped off the sides. Okay, I'm going to let that set for a bit now and I'll give that a light sand. But that. I can just run my hand over that and I can feel all that excess 
started to come off. And uh, can I get the gloss on that? You just start to see the gloss just up here. There it is. Here is that same piece of teak after I've let the shellac and the pumice dry. And if you have a, a close look, you can see where that pumice has sort of um, pulverized the fibers of the wood. It's set, it's, it's actually quite firm now. So what I'll do is I'll rub that back with some very fine sandpaper, and it's worn out sandpaper, so it's not gonna cut into the surface. It's just gonna sort of abrade what's on top. And the other thing that happens is you get it around these edges, you know, it sort of makes a fuzzy sort of edge on it, which you've got to clean off as well. Now, here's the other one. Now, I did that same process. So I sanded that back with some uh, fine, worn-out sandpaper, and I've gone over that, and I started rubbing on just straight shellac, no pumice, and I've used the soft cotton rubber for doing this one. And you can see there's a beginning of the gloss coming up on that. And that's probably as far as I'll go with this piece. I'll probably rub this back with a bit of um, steel wool. And then we're going to start with the nitrocellulose sanding sealer, which is a, um, a high build um, primer, if you like. And uh, that will fill the remaining grain and prep it for the top coat. So uh, if you can see large areas of sort of like a white or a, a light um, brown uh, texture in that, it's really where the pumice has filled the grain. Now that tends to become translucent as you put more coats of shellac on it. So although it looks a bit terrible at the moment, once we build it up with new coats of shellac, that's going to spread out and uh, it won't be quite as visible. So this time I'm using the rubber made at that soft cotton from a t-shirt. I find that it just gives a slightly more uniform finish. Now almost straight away you can see that white blush or that light brown blush starting to disappear as the new coats of shellac dissolve that and drive it further into the grain. And what we should see shortly is a, a high quality gloss coming up on that as well. So this time I'm just rubbing with the grain. Remember to just keep the pad moving, don't hesitate at all. Now this doesn't uh, look like it takes very long at all, but uh, believe me, if you want to get a mirror finish just using shellac, you're looking at probably uh, like two or three hours of polishing to get that and you're probably looking at about 50, 60, 80 coats to build that up and get that level of finish. But already that's starting to get a gloss on it. And like I say, this is not the finished coating, this is just to give it colour and to fill the grain. And I think you'll see that all of that um, blush is gone now, so the pumice has been absorbed by the, the grain, by the, uh, the actual texture in the grain, and the shellac has started to make that transparent. So this is what I'm going to use to do the edge of the plywood, this uh, Feast Watson product, uh, these are called a proof tint, and uh, these are very concentrated spirit based dye, or wood stain if you like to call it that. And these can be added to shellac or to a nitrocellulose lacquer. You can then spray or finish that normally and it will darken the wood depending on how much of this you put in the finish. So put a lot in, spray it on, it's going to go almost black. Just put a couple of drops and it's going to give it that slight tone of the walnut colour. In this case I'm going to put this on neat uh, once again using one of these cotton wool buds. So this is this starts really thin, it's like water. So just get a little bit on the, the end of the cotton wool bud like that. And we're just gonna go along this edge. So 
So that's given that the colour that I want. So you can see here it hasn't bled past that edge there because that's already sealed with shellac. But it's brought the colour up the way I want it. Here's another edge which is just the raw colour of the plywood. Okay, so that now is ready for the nitrocellulose lacquer. Now, before I go to this stage of putting on this lacquer, I have to admit to you uh, the awful truth about working with MDF, and that is that I completely underestimated the amount of expansion and contraction I was going to get with this material. Now, I was working on this the other day. I put the clock over onto its face like that to work on the back and I was working flat on the bench and I noticed that the whole clock was rocking backwards and forwards and I couldn't figure that out. I turned over and had a good look and then realized that this section here of the clock carcass had bowed up and uh, laterally as well and the amount of movement in that material was incredible. Now I did some remedial work on this, which I'll explain in a minute, but even now I'll show you that this is far from flat. So if I put that straight edge on there, I'll just turn this around so you can see it. I don't know if you can see that, but under this corner of the rule here is about, uh, what, two millimeters? Uh, showing that this edge here has bowed upwards. And uh, that's after I did the remedial work on it. Now, the thing about this is that uh, I had to cut away this inside section of the clock here, leaving this very narrow strip of wood. It's only 10 millimeters thick, and it's all sort of side grain, if you know what I mean. So there's a piece of MDF board, and that deep section there is basically made up from the cross section of this MDF. Now, uh, you will know what happens if this stuff gets uh, moisture on it. It just expands, uh, sometimes almost double its thickness. And that's precisely what's happened here. Now, the weather uh, where I'm working at the moment is being hot and humid. We've had a lot of rain, and uh, this has obviously absorbed a lot of moisture over the last couple of days. And it's caused this to expand uh, vertically. Now, because there's veneer on the other side, which was limiting the amount of movement I could get on the other side there, this has had no choice but to bow outwards to alleviate that sort of stress on this side. Now, when I realised what had happened, I knew, I sort of knew that I should have veneered both sides of that section. So that's what I've done. I've glued a piece of very thin plywood. This plywood's only about a 64th of an inch thick, but it is a three ply and uh, my reasoning was that this is going to stabilize the back of that section of MDF and it has come back a bit it's nowhere near as bad as it was but I have also realized that I need to try and strengthen this side here so what I've done is I've made up a, a series of these little plywood blocks now they're going to get glued in there like that and I'm going to clamp all of the front of the clock so that it's dead flat when I do this. Now these are going to serve two purposes. They allow me to rest the Lixie display on top of those and that will keep the Lixie display at the correct height. I've cut the, the holes in there so I can feed wiring through underneath the circuit boards. But it's also going to give this front section something to glue to and pull it back and then lock it in place and hopefully that's going to fix the problem. But uh, when I saw how bad it was, I immediately thought, right, I'm going to have to bin this and start again and work with plywood, which would have been a better choice, really. You know, looking at it like that looks okay, but if you get it in the right light, you can see it that is curved in here. So that was a bit of a disappointment for me and something I didn't uh, anticipate. <laughs> oh, what can you do? I've sort of got to keep going with it now. But um, I've also noticed that there are other places where you can see slight discrepancies in that surface there where the joints have been made between the top and the sides of the clock. So uh, that's going to be another thing that's going to show up. But uh, you live and learn. Um, 
maybe MDF wasn't the best choice for this. Anyway, let's keep moving forward. Well, here is the other one, uh, which I've had in the clamps now pretty much overnight. So I've got four of those blocks glued and clamped in there, and I've clamped the front of the clock to a, a big heavy section of timber to try and stabilise that and straighten it. So I'll take these clamps off and we'll just see whether we've been successful here. Everything was a bit awkward to clamp and to hold, and I've got to be very careful not to damage the veneer that's already on there, so I've had to put masking tape and blocks and all sorts of things there to try and prevent any marking of that veneer. So that's what I had clamped to the front of the clock and I made sure that that was coated with uh, tape and I checked it to make sure it was straight before I clamped it on there. So there are those blocks sitting there and the Lixi display panels will sit on top of that and brings them up to the right height. So this is what I was hoping to fix. Okay, well it's better than it was, but it's not perfect. There's a, a very slight dish, maybe like a half a millimetre deep. So these two edges are raised and higher, and it's slightly dished in the, the centre there. But um, you never know, that may straighten out when the weather settles down. It's pretty good that way. It's maybe like a half a millimetre higher in the centre but once again way better than what it was so I might have dodged a bullet there and sort of got away with that uh, if it was any worse and I wasn't able to fix it I was prepared to scrap this completely and start again with plywood that's uh, one of the things about having Asperger's syndrome is that you get a failure like that and you just can't live with it you've got to bin it and start again Okay, so let's get some uh, lacquer on this now and uh, I'll fix the other one and we'll go from there. So the coating I'm putting on first is a sanding sealer. So it's like a heavy bodied undercoat. It dries flat and then you sand that back and it's easy to sand. It tends to be, um, or it tends to fill cracks and splits and low spots and so on. And you basically sand that back till you get a pretty flawless finish and then you put your top coat on. So I've um, rubbed this back with steel wool um, and some very, very fine worn out sandpaper just to take the, the bugs and the nibs off the surface. And uh, we'll give this about three or four coats of the sanding sealer. I'm going to do this in stages so I can do the bits that I can get out easily and then I'll let that set, turn it over, do the underside and because it's clear you've got to keep track of where you paint it because you, it's very hard to tell how much you're building up on that surface and of course you want to avoid getting any runs and sags in the finish at this stage. And I've done exactly that. <laughs> I've got one there. But the good thing about this is it does set quickly and it allows you to rub that high spot off without damaging the underlying layer. So there you go, that's me just showing off and not watching what I'm doing. spray gun that I'm using here is a high volume low pressure gun and I find these are ideal when you're working on small parts uh, where a high pressure gun would uh, simply blow the part away or stir up a lot of dust in the surrounding area and have that settle on the wet paint. These also give you far less overspray so you don't waste quite so much paint.
Well, here are the pieces that you just saw me spraying, but these have been sitting for about a week now, just simply because I was away on a, on a break. But uh, you can usually sand this back like um, an hour or two hours after you sprayed. And one of the good things about this nitrocellulose uh, ready seal, which is the sanding sealer that Watt will make, is that it contains a filler. The filler is like a powder, and uh, it does two things. It uh, does fill any remaining voids or cracks in the surface of the timber or open grain, and it also aids with the sanding process. So as you're sanding, it releases that powder, and it tends to um, uh, not allow the grit to pick that uh, waste material up. It sort of sheds that as you sand it. So what I'm using here is a 360 grit no-fill type paper. Um, it's got that white coating on it and it, it also has a coating that uh, helps to repel any of those sticky, sticky particles that you pick up from the paint. I'm also using a soft sanding block uh, mainly because it'll conform really well to the curves on this case here. But also a hard sanding block may tend to sort of um, produce hard spots as you sand over and that can lead to pressions and scratches in the surface. So what you should be able to see is that white powder being released as a sand. As much as possible go with the grain. and it doesn't take too much work to get that looking pretty flat. And you can see that very, very slight sheen to it, which is what you're looking for. And if I do that all over now, that'll be ready for the top coat. So I'm just gonna do a bit of this and then we'll wind up this video. Okay, well that piece at least is done and if you remember what that looked like when it started there's almost no evidence now of any of the open grain or open pores in that material and that's now ready for its top coat. So what I'm going to do is I'll get all the rest of these pieces done and in an upcoming episode, not sure which one, we're going to have a look at the, the final spray coat on all of these parts and also fitting the little decorative elements at the corner here. So um, thanks for watching along. I hope you've learned something. Uh, I know this is sort of turning into uh, way more episodes than I ever imagined. But um, hey, who cares? It's all about the building process, isn't it? So um, catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching.